Hello, Ryan here, and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all of the news from the week just past. Be sure to subscribe if you like what you see, and let's get on with it. This week, our questions surrounding the Misk Expanse are answered. We check out derelict points of interest in Pyro, plus Alpha 317 has now officially released to the live servers. So Inside Star Citizen is back from its hiatus with a great episode to kick off this new quarter. To begin with, we were shown updates to the biome accumulation system, which is how the environment builds upon the player, their weapons and items and clothing and eventually pretty much everything. Right now in game, it is quite clear that only the armor and undersuits gather the environmental buildup with it not yet being applied to things like weapons and items. So quite visually obvious, if you've got a weapon on your back, your armor is completely white from walking around Microtech, but the weapon is not affected. And for one of the developers, this was very annoying when he would play Star Citizen, and so he set about creating a procedural system to ensure that all of these elements receive accurate buildup consistently, be that sand, soot, mud, or grime, and so on. So he put together this presentation on how he tackled this, and he says that right now there is only one single texture handling all the accumulation effects per asset. So he wanted to make this process procedural, so he said about using Substance Designer to automate any textures needed for any required biome, which alleviates all the labor off of the artists, as well as ensures the consistent visual result, rather than having all the multiple artists do this individually. And he says as well that with graphics support, it will become even better. Now, firstly, it is great to see Stefan back in the hot seat. It has been quite a minute since he was in front of the camera, but a big thanks to him as we will soon be seeing the consistency from biome to biome with it not just being applied to armor, but everything at the same time. And just like many of the other tools that they create, it takes the workload off of the artists and developers, freeing up their time to focus elsewhere. So a big win-win for sure. And thank you, Stefan, for working on this. Now, next up, we have an AI and EU sandbox team sprint report. First up, we can see an NPC collision resolver, which solves the issue for when NPCs are in narrow ship corridors, where originally they would just kind of have no collision and then walk straight through each other or get stuck when they have collision, which of course doesn't look good as they kind of clip through. Now this new system will temporarily shrink the physics bubble for the AI and then change to the relevant animations, allowing the NPCs to pass through the various situations unimpeded. Now this is only another small thing, but like we have seen in Squadron 42's Vertical Slice, it does make a big difference, especially when you're in close quarters where there is potentially a lot of NPCs moving around. Not to mention when NPCs are fully populating the PU, I'm sure there will be many situations where they will need to alter and move past each other. So just adding that nice little touch of realism for the environment. Next, we can see the work being done to allow NPCs to fly down from orbit for the very many various reasons, like delivering goods, picking up players, providing reinforcements for players and so on. But here we are seeing the work being done to ensure that the AI don't follow the terrain too precisely in their maneuvering, where they bob up and down with every single planetary obstacle way below the ship, which will make it look very odd. So the AI flight path system is getting a new feature to allow for local and look ahead searches to not only keep a safe altitude, but also fly more smoothly and naturally. Plus it can be used to allow the NPCs to determine their own landing locations. Now this is actually pretty big stuff. Eventually having NPCs capable of taking off, landing, flying, walking around on a planet's surface, using elevators, trams, and so on and so forth. And all of this work is currently underway and in many cases, almost complete. All of this when done will enable NPCs to move around the persistent universe, just like the player can, producing missions, beacons, assistance, or threats for the player to deal with. So another very important step to getting NPCs actually populating the world and doing exactly what the players can. Now the AI team are also working to improve the downed state reactions, which is when an NPC finds a body. Here we can see them rushing over to the body, investigating it, and then being on alert and kind of fanning out to search. In this next scenario, we can see one NPC cautiously approaching while the other one hangs back and covers them, 
Also, do note that this is the Asiedo station from Squadron 42. So, of course, all of this work is specifically needed for Squadron, but then we'll come over to the PU as well. Now, in the final example, they are showing us the improved response times for when an NPC notices a player or a threat in general, I guess. And I do suspect that the ability for the NPCs will vary somewhat and some might be quicker than others based on their visual or audible perception capabilities. But this sort of work will be very applicable to those underground facilities. If you shoot someone stealthily, then an NPC might notice the body go rushing over and then be on alert, just providing a bit more complexity to the AI. Now, next up, we can see a recently finished sprint for NPCs using vending machines and the process they go through from choosing what drink, using the Moby Glass to make a purchase, sitting down and then drinking that drink and then disposing of that can or whatever as trash where the item can then be properly despawned to preserve server performance. And then in some cases, they can get frustrated when the vending machine doesn't work. Now from there, we checked in with the EU Sandbox team and their work on derelict outposts that they say are to be found in Pyro. Here is a white box traversal test to ensure that players are able to move around unimpeded. These derelict outposts, they say, are just one of many upcoming points of interest to play host to various mission types, storytelling opportunities, as well as potential PvP firefights. Now, I love seeing all the work on these types of locations. And although many of these points of interest will be brought to Stanton at some point, maybe not these ancient ruins for obvious reasons. But I do feel like CIG will likely reveal these points of interest with Pyro first before spreading them around Stanton. And Pyro in comparison already seems far more packed with the locations and content than Stanton does. Now talking of Pyro, we got to see the work being done for more gameplay opportunities out in the furthest reaches of the Pyro system. What we can see here are some early pre-production work on some larger scale points of interest to be explored throughout the system. They use debris from capital ships and even defunct, damaged or destroyed space stations from Pyro's past, as the system is far older than Stanton in terms of discovery and expansion with a rich and violent history, which they want to reflect in the verse by way of a variety of husks, relics and other aging locations for players to discover, which also includes some variations with predetermined pathing solutions that will guide players through dangerous environments. And finally, they are also working on locations that might require players to actually use their snubcraft to venture deeper in. As Jared puts it, as the mission system spawns its myriad of mission types like exploration, collect, attack, rescue, salvage, repair and more, they also want to create environments to compel players to leave their larger ships on the outskirts using the smaller craft instead. And he also does say that we will learn more about what we are seeing here and this location later in the year. So as you can see, not only are they working on the dynamic mission system that will provide tons of new missions of varying types, they're also working on so many different points of interest for these missions to take place, but also creating locations for exploration gameplay and much more. It is going to be quite the year watching all of this come to fruition and hopefully by the end of 2022, we may even be stepping into the pyro system for the first time. That was a great episode of Inside Star Citizen, but let's move on. So also this week, we had the Q&A for the Misk Expanse, a great read that certainly clears up a lot of what I wanted to know. Plus, it really makes me want an Expanse now. Uh, the Galactopedia was updated as well, with more entries helping to establish the lore of the verse. The roadmap was updated, but I have already covered this in a separate video, which I will link in the description below, should you want to check that out. Star Citizen Live this week was with one of the Montreal concept artists creating a new concept for a type of derelict outpost. Uh, a great episode, so do watch that at your leisure if it is a subject that you are interested in. And finally, Alpha 317 was officially released to the live servers, and with it came a whole slew of different posts, from ship sales like for the Miss Calais and the Starfarer, to the full patch notes of the build, and even a checklist for players to tick off all the various stuff you can do in the verse. So if you are new to Star Citizen, I highly recommend downloading this list and going through them as it has all the current things to do in the verse 
which may open you up to opportunities you never knew existed. I too will be downloading this list and going through it. Maybe we'll do that on stream, that might be fun. But I hope you're all enjoying 317. I am yet to try it as I have a busy weekend uh, in real life. But do let me know how you are getting on with 317 Live. So that brings us to the end of the show. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button. Also, I am able to do this thanks to my very generous patrons and channel members. If you appreciate what I do and would like to help make it even better from as little as $1 a month, all of the links are provided below.